<laughs> okay, um, so one of the things we do, and I think God has blessed us in many ways as a church, is we're very, you know, we're still, we're generous to, we hand out a lot of material, we hand out Bibles for free, people come and they take a bunch of them, go to their places of employment, you know, we do a lot of things, no charge. Uh, we also support a ton of missionaries. We have people in Africa, in Europe, in, you know, uh, in local inner cities here, right? Some people haven't heard the word there. We go to uh, homeless missions. We, we do a lot of stuff. Uh, but we, so we were blessed. We, we so many missionaries, uh, once a month, we're going to be doing this. And uh, actually, we have a missionary who's in the Israel area, all right, who's going to be coming up very soon to tell us what's going on. But uh, today I want to introduce, before he comes up, Pastor Denny Barger. Actually, he was in the military many years ago, uh, came to the Lord at some point, uh, has been active in ministry and missions for decades. <laughs> so cool. He's gone to places I only read about. He's been to the Arabian Peninsula. He's been to the Near East, Far East. He's been to Europe. And it's just amazing. He meets with Muslims, Jewish people, just building these bridges through his ministry, Dreams Alive, and uh, he builds those bridges and he shares his faith. Some of the stories you told me over the phone, I can't wait to listen later to see what else you tell the congregation, but I'm going to let you see what ministry looks like overseas through his eyes, so he's going to come up, Pastor Denny, come up and uh, share with us. Thank you again. <laughs> As Good morning. It's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, I have been here before, years ago. Uh, one year, my wife stood here on my behalf because I had visa issues at the airport and they wouldn't let me out. And uh, I, I heard she was very well received, so thank you for that. Um, I don't know about you, but like the psalmist said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Are you glad today? Are you happy? That's a good thing. We should be the happiest people in the world, man. We're going to heaven one day. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. In fact, one year I got so sick, I was in the hospital in the ICU for six days, and at some point my wife comes to see me. She says, you got to get out of the bed and come to the window, and she drags me over to the window, and there's all these people in the parking lot. I said, what's going on? She said, there's people down there praying for you. There's people all around the world praying for you. I said, tell them to stop. I'm this close. She said, you're the most selfish man I ever knew. So, anyway, let's um, get started with these uh, slides, if we can, Jim. Huh? There you go. All right, that's the official name of the ministry, which you as a church support, and I am grateful and thank you for it. I don't take a salary from it. All of it goes to the Lord. Why is everybody running in here? I'm... Hmm? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Let's pray. Lord, we love you so much, and your word tells us that you are known as the great physician. We ask you to bless this brother, sister here, Lord, and uh, touch touch with your healing touch and give the nurses and those others wisdom to your glory in Jesus name amen
Mary Ellen, is that the name? Mary Alice. Mary Alice. You know, Mary Alice, usually when I get up to the podium, handsome as I am, more women pass out. <laughs> so, I understand, and we hope the Lord will bless you. So hang in there with us, all right? Oh, no, she's going to leave, okay. That's probably wise with me. I got you. <laughs> Don't worry, half of them will leave. You know, we had this happen once years ago, and I, I pastored a church in South Jersey, and the, when the people heard the police were coming, half the congregation ran out the door. So, God is so good, and that's what it's about, loving one another in the local church. You know, uh, I had many pastors tell me that people got comfortable staying at home during COVID, and they wouldn't come back to the church. Pastors were crying, you know, like, I don't understand why they're not coming back. This is why you come back, because you have a family that cares for you, you know, and the more involved you are, the more they'll feel like family, so I encourage you to, you know, keep coming out, and uh, yeah, because they're going to come up with some other diseases, or so-called diseases, anyway, so just, just don't worry about it, just come. So, anyway, um, Behind me, uh, you'll see a couple things. Uh, that's my email there. Write it down. You might want to write to me and threaten me or something. I don't know. Uh, but um, that's the name of the ministry. You support it as a church. And uh, Pastor Joe asked me to touch on three subjects. So this is going to be interesting because we don't have a whole lot of time. But those are the subjects we're going to talk about. And, uh, you know, the, the idea of trying to be brief... It, kind of cracked me up when he asked me. It reminded me of a pastor who uh, cut himself shaving one morning, and he went out to the kitchen there where his wife was, and she said, well, what happened? And he said, well, I, I was concentrating on my sermon and shaving, and I cut my face. And his wife said, maybe you should concentrate on your shaving and cut your sermons. So uh, that's not going to happen today. So if you have to get up and go, do so. But um, a couple of things before we get started. Uh, by God's grace, uh, a friend of mine last year, we started a uh, Calvary Chapel Bible College down in Marlton. It's near Cherry Hill. Uh, it's a church that has Hope FM. I don't know if that comes up here or not. But uh, we have some brochures out there for that. And if there's anyone in the medical field, I'm going to be talking a little bit about medical missions. And I had about a dozen of these magazines. This is Calvary Chapel Magazine. And last year they went with us on a trip into Jordan. Uh, our team goes to other places as well. I only go with them when they're in the Middle East because, you know, I speak a little Arabic and I don't know, for some reason they feel safe when I'm around. I'm, I'm basically going for the food, but there you go. So there's just a couple, but if you have a medical background, please pick one up and consider what the Lord could do with the skills that he's given you. So... By way of introduction, my bride, Susan, uh, she's not here today. She's got a chest cold going. But uh, she and I have been serving the Lord for a long time, and it's a real joy to serve the Lord. It really is. Um, most of that time, uh, it's been between here and in the Middle East. We lived in Cairo for almost six years when we were young, and uh, then we lived in Bahrain uh, for seven years. And how many of you know where Bahrain is? Okay. <laughs> I think we have a picture of it somewhere. It'll show up. But um, love the Lord. And we're here in Ocean County now, Southern Ocean County. And, and by God's grace, I get to go in and out of the Middle East. Um, the ministry for us began in 1982. I do have a picture for that, Jim. Uh, the Lord called us to serve a group of Christian garbage collectors in Cairo. And that's a picture of the street scenes when I first got there in 1982. And I was privileged to work with a, a pastor who had been called to give his life there. And he served, he served there for 40 years. I was there with him for five and a half years. Sixty percent of those kids died before their fifth birthday. You know, um, if, you've, if you've never done it, Stop and pray and thank the Lord that you were born in the USA. Okay, this is the greatest country in the world, and, and you can, we have such good health care and all that. Um, but it was tough over there, and uh, we did our best. And uh, by God's grace, we were able to build a school for the kids. They had no school. They had no clinic. Uh, the clinic, we actually started a clinic, which became a hospital. So God was good. 
Um, now, let's put the next one up, Jim. There, we, there was the church. That was the first church uh, that was planted there. And uh, you can see the surroundings. It really was a mess at that time. It's radically changed. In fact, you should have seen me the day asphalt got put down. You know, you wouldn't think you'd get excited about asphalt, but when you're walking through, you know, animal poop and dead animals and garbage and dirt and all, you know, asphalt's a nice thing. It's your friend. So I was pretty excited to see that. But I put this up here to show you that one person whose heart is committed to the Lord and is grateful for what the Lord has done for him and, and obeys the Lord by looking around to other people, God can do a lot just through one person. Let's see the next one, Jim. Okay. He built a church into a cave. It was an interesting story. Uh, it seats over 20,000 people. It's the largest church in Africa in a garbage dump, if you can imagine, okay? And uh, periodically, the, the pastor, Simon, and I would go up to that cave before he made it into a church, and there was an old hermit there. His name was Galini. And we would go in, and Galini said he could see angels. Now, he was really hard to understand, you know? So he'd say, Galini, are there any angels? And he'd go, you know, and he's pointing around. And I'm standing there like, yeah, okay, Bubba. Um, and I wondered, you know, I, I wondered, though, is Galini closer to the Lord than I am, or is he a madman, you know? Is Galini a man of great faith, or am I a man of little faith? After Galini died, Simon felt the Holy Spirit leading him to pull the dirt and rocks out of that cave, and this is what became of it. What do you think? I think Galini was a, was a man of God. I think he was spiritual, and I think there were angels in that cave. And I'll go to my grave believing that. And uh, I had a chance to be in that cave uh, about a month ago. My friend Simon, actually it was two months ago, my friend Simon died, he passed away. And I want to say something. And, and this isn't bragging about anything but Jesus. That man touched so many lives that at his funeral, over 40,000 people showed up. I asked one of my friends, you know, we got talking about Muslims becoming Christians. He said, by the way, are you still interested? I said, yeah, of course. And he said, we figured out over 8,000 Muslims were baptized here in this one church. Isn't that great? Say hallelujah. Come on. All right, get me going. I got to get going because I'm going too slow right now. So um, anyway, it's for the Lord's glory. And uh, that's the important thing to remember when we're serving God, it's all about him. If you're thankful, you'll want to do something. It's not earning your salvation. That's already taken care of. But to live for Christ, what an adventure it is being a Christian. Um, we came back here after that ministry in 1988, planted a church, Calvary Chapel of Southern Ocean County. Stayed there for 14 years, and then the Lord tugged on my heart about the Middle East again. And uh, I left there and started going around teaching Americans about all these immigrants that are coming. You know, there's Muslims who are just pouring through. And uh, some of them legally, some of them not so legally. And we look at that as a problem, but I want to just suggest for a moment that as Christians, let's look at it as an opportunity. These people come from places where if you share the gospel with them, you might be put in prison. In fact, I'll be in Jordan in a couple weeks again, and uh, I know for a fact that if I shared the gospel with a Muslim there uh, and it was found out by the police, uh, I could be arrested and put in jail for three years. That doesn't happen here in uh, Jamesburg, does it? No. You know, we don't live in a police state. We don't have a state religion uh, as many countries do. So we came back and um, we were doing the Dreams Alive thing, going around sharing with Christians, how to reach their Muslim neighbors. And it's not as hard as you think. It really, it's just, you know, those people, they, they talk about God a lot. If you were to share the gospel with your agnostic or atheist neighbors, it might take you two or three years just to convince them there's a God. When you talk to a Muslim, we jump to Jesus right away. They want to know all about Jesus. So don't be afraid of that. Now in 2012, let's put another one up here, Jim. We moved to Bahrain. Ah, there it is. I wrote Bahrain in big letters. It's at the end of that arrow. It's a tiny little uh, island nation that's smaller than Ocean County, but it's tucked between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Nice neighbors. <laughs> but uh, 
We loved it there. And my wife was a kindergarten teacher in a school, a Muslim school, actually. They had a, a, a motto of teaching critical thinking as well as Islamic values. Let's put the next one up, Jim. And I'm asking her, like, well, how's that going for you, you know? And she said, well, the values they want me to teach are being, you know, loving your mom and dad, being good citizens. She said, it's a lot of stuff I used to teach in the Christian school here in the state. I said, well, why are you in that school? And she said, well, you know, I got thinking about it when I had a choice of schools to go to. And there was a Christian school, but she ignored that. She wanted to go to this Islamic school, uh, you know, a government school. By the way, that good-looking one in the very front with the glasses next to the blonde, that's Susan, okay? Wish she was here. Um, but I said, you know, why did you choose to go there? And she said, well, I realized from our ministry that there may come a time when these kids get older that others who are filled with hate will teach them to hate Jews and to hate Christians. And I thought, what can I do about that? And she said, I wanted to love them so much in the name of Christ that they, when they grew up, they wouldn't hate Christians because they would remember Miss Sue and the love she gave to them. Does that make sense to you? See, love wins. Love wins. It, it's a great thing. By the way, um, if you ever want to do a ministry to kids, I know that VBS is coming up. Ladies, most of you put your perfume on your wrist and maybe behind your ears. Not a kindergarten teacher. They put it right across here. <laughs> I was interviewed one time in Bahrain uh, about something to do with ISIS, and uh, the interviewer, her son, had been in my wife's class, and she said, oh, my son wants to marry your wife. I said, well, tell him, forget it. Okay? <laughs> I, I got her, and he said, she, he always used to come home and say, Miss Sue smells so good. <laughs> you love them. That's how you win the day. Uh, let's put the next one up. I was the pastor of an international church there. Uh, we had people from 70 different nations worshiping together, <laughs> and we got along with each other. Can you imagine that? I mean, the Holy Spirit worked overtime there. And uh, we had a good time worshiping the Lord. Uh, there were Muslims that came, uh, and I had the opportunity to baptize a lot of people, as pastors do. And this is a picture of one of our baptisms. Um, I don't know if you can read it there behind me. Yeah, so you can see the different nations they're from. And uh, those three women in the middle there were from communist China. And after the baptism, one of the ladies said to me, I was an atheist living in a communist dictatorship. God moved me to an Islamic monarchy in order to meet Jesus, the Jewish Prince of Peace, and be baptized by a Christian pastor from America. She said, wow, how far the hand of God will go to save sinners like me. Come on. Amen, right? God loves people. He saved you. I'm looking at you. You're nothing special, okay? <laughs> But God thought you were special. And he sent people to share his love with you and his word with you. And by his grace, you were saved. That's a wonderful thing. Now, a wee bit more about this ministry since you support it. Uh, let's put the next one up. Okay, this is me in Jordan. I'll be there uh, February 15th again uh, with a medical team. That's basically what we do there. Uh, let's go with another one, Jim. This is our main reason for going uh, in February. It's a missions, medical mission trip. Again, if you are a medical professional, uh, take a look at one of those magazines. There's a whole article about it. But we're going to try and show you a film clip. Can we try that one, fellas? There we go. My name is Laurel Downs, and I'm a physician. And we, I'm coming here for about seven or eight actually um, with a team of medical people from the United States um, we've brought physical therapists nurse practitioners pediatricians doctors um, in order to provide health care to Iraqi and Syrian refugees as well as Jordanians who need help we've been partnering all that time with market church and sense of community um, as they're doing outreach in the community um, once we leave, they continue um, to provide health care, to provide 
all kinds of supportive services for the refugees. And we come because we really want to share um, hope with these people, as well as medical care that's desperately needed. And we want to share the love of Jesus with people um, because that's really an impact them for eternity. Um, and it's just been a tremendous blessing to be here. We actually get more out of this than we give. Um, we enjoy partnering with the church. We have built relationships over the years with translators, with patients, and with the people in the community. And it's just a joy to be here. You know, God gives us gifts and skills. It's not just to get rich, okay? Uh, that was actually my main message to the people in Bahrain. We had a lot of people from around the world who came there because of jobs, good paying jobs. They didn't have to pay taxes. Oh boy, can you save money without the government? And, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of them were working in Saudi Arabia. I couldn't go into Saudi Arabia because my identity card uh, said I was a priest. So they don't like priests coming in. And uh, although there are pastors and missionaries in there, I'll tell you that. Um, but I couldn't go. So I would tell my congregation all the time, do you really think God gave you these skills and this job to make you rich and comfortable? I don't read the Bible that way. And there's nothing wrong with being rich and comfortable, but my goodness, use it for the Lord. And so they started sharing the gospel in Saudi Arabia. It was crazy. And they got so excited about it, you know. Uh, and I hope you'll get excited about it too. So, but we need to move on. Let's see, where am I? Um, okay, next one, Jim. All right, we also have a school there, and, you know, we've uh, brought education to uh, a lot of Iraqi and Syrian refugee kids over the years. Uh, you may not understand this, but when war happens, school stops. School stops. This whole bit going on in Israel and Gaza, there's no school. They're lucky they're alive. Uh, but... You know, part of life is to educate kids. So we do our best to build schools wherever we go. And we've built a few by God's grace. Um, let's see the next one. I forget what's up there. Uh, we'll wait. Okay, let's wait on that. Uh, one of the uh, recent ministries we've started in Jordan with, uh, with that local church. And we always work with the local church uh, wherever we go. Um, unless we're planting a church, and we've got one of those going on in Jordan. But um, we went to this Palestinian area, and the idea was to go there and uh, just love on the kids. There was a community center, and so our team went there, uh, mostly Jordanians, and they were teaching the kids that God is love, and his, in his love, he loves them as well, because he does. And uh, we were there, and I was with the director of that uh, community center. She almost like the mayor of that community. And let me tell you, this was one of those times where we went to this slum, a concrete slum, if you will. Not like the Cairo thing, but a concrete slum. No trees, nothing. And we're going down these skinny little streets, and there's traffic everywhere, and I started to get a little nervous. Okay? Never, ever, ever think that this guy is heroic, okay? I'm a coward. And I, my biggest fear going in the Middle East is that somebody's going to put a black bag over my head and throw me in the back of a van and, and then call my wife and say, hey, we got him. We want 100000 She, She and I already had to talk about this. We're planning. She said, say your prayers, honey. I'm not giving them $100,000. I'm not giving them $20. You know, I mean, it just isn't going to happen. So we pray for God's protection. But I'm in this community, and I'm talking to this lady. Mind you, she's covered. All I can see is her eyes. Everything's covered in black, gloves and all. And I said to her, well, what's the biggest problem you have in this slum? She said, young girls getting married. I said, well, what do you mean by that? She said, well, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. I was chewing on that for a minute or two. I'm a grandpa, by the way. I got 13 grandkids and, and a great-grandchild, and I have six of my own kids. You know, and that's horrific to hear something like that to me. But I'm thinking about it. And I said, so what's your second biggest problem? Well, young girls getting divorced. I said, what are you talking about? Well, she says, you know, 16, 17, 18. They like them young. That's sick. That's really sick, but it's supported by the religion. And um, all I can say is people need Jesus, uh, right? I mean, people need the Lord. Because when you get saved, maybe you have a different approach uh, to life. I hope so. 
Let's go on. Now, this is northern Iraq, um, and it's a before and after picture. That, that messy thing was an old school that they had. The government will not help them because they're Christians living up in a Kurdish area. It's a crazy thing in the Middle East. Everybody hates one another. I don't know. What do you do with that, you know? Uh, but they do, and the Christians, they don't have militias or anything, so they can't really fight back even if they felt led. So we just go and we do our best. And, and like I said, you can see we renovated that school for them. And I am so excited because in May, at the end of May, uh, I've been invited to Baghdad. And we're going to do an inductive Bible study for Christians that are still left in Baghdad. Not too many of them. Most of the Christians want to get out of there because it's not a, well, it can be unhealthy. Uh, let's just say that. Uh, in 2022, we expanded into Europe. We brought over $50,000 of aid to Ukrainian refugees. I had a chance to go to the Ukraine, and uh, we were in there at night, and we were trying to head back to the Polish border. I was in the back sleeping. The car starts doing ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. You know, we're in this van. I, so I sat up to the, the two guys in the front. We had, we had already delivered all our supplies, you know. So I sit up. I look around. We're like in the middle of nowhere, you know. And I said, what happened? They, oh, we got lost. I said, you got lost. We're in a war zone, you knuckleheads. Get the map out, you know. And uh, anyway, we obviously made it on back here. But that was fun. <laughs> we, it actually was, you know. I never ate so many pierogies in my life, you know. <laughs> and then people eat them for breakfast. It's crazy. Anyway, um, we also have a team in Europe uh, in Germany, in, witnessing the Muslims. This is a Syrian guy who got saved, and um, so he's up there with his new wife, and uh, I'll talk about him a little bit uh, in a few minutes. But let's go to the next one. Look, this isn't about any individual Christian or any church or denomination. This is what it's about. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters and I, you did for me. You know, we have so many opportunities. I once heard a couple biker guys who became Christians. This is when I was a new Christian, 40 years ago. And they were speaking. And the one guy said, you know, if you don't know what the Lord wants you to do with your life, who, you, who he wants you to minister to, put a blindfold on and walk out your front door. He said, I guarantee you within five minutes, you'll bump into somebody who needs Jesus. Amen? Well, let's go to part two. Uh, Pastor Joe asked me to talk a little bit about the Israel-Hamas war. And uh, I, I'm going to say some things. I hope you're okay with it. We'll find out. But from my missionary perspective, this is not your normal war, okay? This is not a war about borders. It's not a war about, you know, looting the other guy's stuff and enriching yourself as a nation. Um, this is a spiritual war, and it's being fought by two people groups that have yet to acknowledge Jesus as God, okay? That's the distinction between us, the Jews, and the Muslims. So you've got the Jews and the Muslims who are, you know, killing each other. And the Muslims honestly hate the fact, they hate the fact that God has declared the Jews to be the apple of his eye. Now, when I got saved, my, my father-in-law took me aside and he said, hey, I want to talk to you about something. He said, you know, if you ever run into any Jews, you'd be nice to them. I said, really, why do you say that? He said, because they're the apple of God's eye. They're God's people. He said, as a Christian, just be nice to them. They'll drive you crazy, but just be nice. And if you ever drove through Lakewood, need, need I say more? Need I say more? The Muslims hate the fact that the Jews are God's chosen people, and that re they reject Muhammad as an, a legitimate prophet. They refuse to accept him, as I do as well. He's not a prophet. We put people... You know, I said this to a guy. I was out in the middle of the Jordanian desert one time, and this guy, this Muslim guy starts pushing my buttons, right? And I, I don't know, I was in a bad mood or something, but he started saying how the Bible was corrupt, and it was a bunch of lies, and blah, blah, blah. And I looked at him, right, and I said, yeah, well, at least my God isn't a pedophile or a polygamist. And he said, what's that? You know? So I explained, you know, Muhammad had a seven-year-old bride. I don't know if you're aware of that. And he says, but he didn't consummate it until she was nine. I said, well, look, where I come from, we put people like him in prison. 
And then I looked around. I was in the middle of the desert. I mean, I was out way out there with a couple of uh, students that I had, and I thought, I think it's time to end this conversation, you know. <laughs> and, and, and I got out before the knives were drunk. But um, Muslims, you know, that read the Quran really have a lot of hate in their heart. Now, I know many, many, many good Muslim people, but they're secular people. If I were to ask you what makes a good Christian, you might answer by saying someone who reads the New Testament and obeys it. If I asked you what makes a good Muslim, it would not be someone who reads the Quran and obeys it. They have over 17 verses on how to take revenge against your neighbor, but not one verse says God is love or how to love your neighbor. They even have a, a verse for marriage, and this is the advice. Hang the whip in a prominent place where she sees it. Some of you guys are thinking, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> it is a bad idea. Okay? A good Muslim is a secular Muslim. They ignore the Quran. They don't obey it. Okay? And, and a lot of them are open because they see this hatred done in the name of God. And they're like, this really can't be God. And so this is actually a good time uh, in the history of mankind to reach out to Muslims and talk to them about the God of love. Um, by and large, uh, you know, they hate the Jews, but by and large, they hate Christians too. There's a saying in the Middle East, first comes Saturday, then comes Sunday. Do you understand that? Jews worship on Saturday or Friday night and Saturday. We worship on Sunday. So when they're finished with them, they're going to turn on the Christians. And actually, they turn on the Christians periodically anyway. So Israel, on the other hand, Okay, uh, we know from Scripture, in fact, Pastor Joe mentioned Revelation, there is going to become, there will be a time when many Jews will give their heart to Jesus. It's already happening. It's happening among the Muslims. It's also happening among the Jews, okay? Um, I wrote it in here somewhere, but there's something like 10,000 Messianic Jews uh, in Israel. Uh, they, they have the freedom to worship uh, as Christians, um, but they do have limited religious freedom there, okay? Judaism's a state religion, uh, and Muslims, Christians, Druze, and Baha'i are, are free to worship. It's illegal to harass people from other, uh, worship, you know, other religions, but when they say harass, they're also talking about evangelizing. It's illegal in Israel to share your faith with a Jew and lead them to Christ. Very dangerous thing to do. And we need to just acknowledge that. Um, one day, the Lord will take care of that. But meanwhile, as Christians, our job, especially there in the Middle East, is to share Jesus. Because, frankly, he's the answer to every problem that the world has. He, you know, he made the world. He's the word that created the world, so he knows it all. Um, it's illegal to evangelize anyone, especially under the age of 18, and only Jews, real Jews, can immigrate to Israel. If you're a Messianic Jew, you're not allowed to immigrate to Israel, if they know that. Um, and given Jewish history of persecution, I'm okay with some of that, you know? That, that they need a place to live and be safe. And I, actually, I've been appalled at the reaction to this war from Americans. You know, to cry from the river to the sea, that's genocide, you know? And, and so both of them actually have this goal, uh, and it's a mess. Now, how about us as Christians? Um, by the way, I, I should say, look, I'm a Vietnam veteran, okay? I've been in war. I've been to Iraq to minister to the victims of ISIS. I've been to Ukraine to minister to the victims of the Russians. I don't know why I do this. The Lord just draws me to it. But... The thing is, everybody needs Jesus, and there's nothing glorious about war. And if you're sitting around like an armchair general, you know, hoorah, hoorah, please stop that. That's not the voice of Jesus. I really believe that Jesus wants to love people and see them come to him and have good, solid families and all that we cherish here as well. So as Christians, I do believe we have a role to play in this war. Psalm 34, 18 tells us this, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Well, we know that since that war began, over 20,000 people have been killed, over 62,000 have been wounded, 
there are literally thousands of people unaccounted for because of the rubble falling on them. It's horrible. Do you think there's any broken hearts there? I can't imagine, you know, finding parts of my children, you know, in what used to be our house. I hear this stuff all the time, okay? And I would just say to you, the first thing we need to do when we see any atrocity like that is pray, Lord, give me compassion. Give me some love. Help me understand the pain that people have. He died for our pain. He has comforted many of you. I know he's comforted me. Should we not be as he is? I think of that verse when he was on a hill overlooking Jerusalem and he prayed because he said they were like sheep without a shepherd. People need Jesus. So, two questions what can I as an individual person do and what can our church do? A couple of suggestions. Uh, of course, pray. Uh, pray that Hamas is done with, okay? These are wicked people. I could go on about that, you know. I, I used to think there was good in everybody until I encountered ISIS. And boy, the stories I heard. First time up there, I cried every day. I was there for a week. Every night I was crying because of the painful stories I heard trying to bless people as, as I was there. And uh, by the way, I mentioned the 10,000 Messianic Jews in that area. There's also 48,000 Palestinian Christians. All Palestinians aren't evil, okay? There's so many of them. This is the birthplace of the church. This is where it began for us. We shouldn't lose sight of that. We have brothers and sisters living there as well. Now, from what I've learned... There's only 1,000 Christians in Gaza, if that. There were 3,000 when Hamas took over. But again, first comes Saturday, then comes Sunday. They, they all want out. They all, every Christian I know wants to leave that area because it's just not a good deal for them. So we want to pray for them. We want to pray for peace. And, um, you, you know, we want to pray that the Christians that remain start sharing their faith because there's an interesting thing I've discovered over the decades of doing this work. When a Muslim gives his heart to Jesus, you know one of the first things that happens? They stop hating Jews. I'm telling you, they stop hating Jews. I have friends that used to be Muslims that will sit there. They'd go right along with all the revelation talk about, you know, the Jews, uh, you know, being God's, the apple of God's eye and all that. Uh, if you want to read about that, there's a couple books I recommend. One is called Once an Arafat Man. Once an Arafat Man. Taf Sada wrote that book. And then Son of Hamas is another one, or an actual Hamas guy gave his heart to Jesus. And Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. People can change if Christ is in their heart. So the first thing we do is pray. The second is go. Uh, I was sitting in Bahrain when I first heard about the ISIS atrocities. They had come in from Syria, gone down into Iraq, and I'm watching this stuff on my computer, and I'm crying again. And, and I, I started to pray, and I said, Lord, somebody ought to do something. And that still small voice came back and said, well, you're somebody, aren't you, bucko? <laughs> Lord's very blunt with me. Um, and yeah, I was, and the next thing I know, I was, I was in Iraq um, praying with people. You can go to Israel today, you know, with all the men who've been called up to fight against Hamas. Nobody's picking the olives. You could actually go pick olives for a week or two. Wouldn't that be nice? Weather's good over there, okay? Something to think about. Uh, talk to me afterwards. I'll give you lots of opportunities, okay? But the idea is to get up and go. And I want to tell you, when they stop hammering each other in this war and they say, okay, war's over, I'm going. I'm going because the, 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 it needs to be rebuilt. People need to know that God still loves them and that there's a future and a hope, but it's to be found in Christ. And we'll go not just to do evangelism, although everything we do is in the name of Christ, but we'll go and do some rebuilding, whatever the Lord provides. Now, if you can't go, the third thing is obviously to give. Um, you know, if you give to our ministry, 100% of it goes to the work. I don't take a salary. By God's grace, he's fixed me up. Um, and in other ways. But you can give uh, in, as a church. Calvary Chapel of Marlton. Calvary Chapel of Marlton has been collecting goods to send to Israel 
for the victims of Hamas in Israel. And every week they send over these, this stuff, and I forget, they're somewhere way, they're way over $50,000 worth of clothing and things that you as a church could do, or as an individual, Calvary Chapel of Marlton. Um, do we need a seventh inning stretch? Am I boring you? You're yawning. You, you, okay? Okay? No? Okay, well then I'm going to roll on. we got part three coming up. And uh, for part three, let's open our Bibles. Some of you are saying, it's about time. I thought this was a church. Mark, chapter 16. All right. What I want to consider as we wrap this up is that missions is for all of us. It's not just for people like me. It's not, and what does that mean anyway? You know, I'm just a Christian who responded to God's love. That's all I can tell you. Uh, it's, it's not just for short term, but you are a missionary. When you walk out the doors of this building, you are entering the mission field. You understand? I didn't hear one amen out of, out of that. Okay, let's, let's, let's think about it again. When you walk outside the doors of this building, you are entering the mission field. Amen. There we go. Oh, boy. I'm going to get back at the table. I'm going to take all your names. This is great. Well, Mark 16, uh, in verse 14, talking about Jesus after the resurrection. The disciples haven't seen him yet. And it says in verse 14, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And he rebuked them. He rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Where are the disciples? They're sitting at the table. The King James Version says they, they sat at meat. Today we would say they were out to lunch. Okay? Jesus died and so did their hope, their faith, and their purpose. They didn't understand that his purpose was to rise again, to defeat death, to make a way for us to be forgiven of our sins. They didn't understand that. They thought it was all over. They're out to lunch. Do we have a slide up there, Jim? I think we should have one somewhere. Yeah, yeah, let's leave that up for a while. That's the point. Making friends. You know, sometimes words like evangelism and missions make our knees knock. It's like, oh, I don't want to go door to door. I can't do that. Well, don't. I never did, you know. Well, actually, I do, but sometimes. But I don't like it. I like making friends, especially friends that can cook good. <laughs> so Jesus is there. He rebukes them. They didn't have a purpose. Maybe you recall the night before he was crucified, Jesus actually said this. He said, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose... I came to this hour. Now, if we're disciples, and my understanding is we're all disciples, uh, then his purpose, the teacher's purpose, becomes the student's purpose. Okay? So Christ's purpose is our purpose. Not that we have to go out and die on a cross. We don't have to do that. Um, but to just let him be with us. Let him be in us and work through us. It's so simple. Now, look at the rest of this thing. Um, in verse 15, he gives this commission. And, you know, there's two things, basically, about being a Christian. It's the great commandment and the great commission. The great commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? That's the great commandment. This is the great commission. And he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. It's a beautiful passage. And, and it's a commission. He says, hey, Christian, this is what it's all about. You want to have fun? You want to live the Christian adventure? Or do you want to sit in a pew and let the guy talk, 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 talk until your behind hurts you? They taught us in seminary 
The brain can only absorb as much as the backside can endure. <laughs> now, in verse 15, when he says every creature, Matthew actually puts the word nations. And that word nations comes out of the Greek for ethnicities, okay? And he's saying, go to all different types of people with different ethnic backgrounds. Now, here in America, God has made cross-cultural ministry very easy. Amen? Do you guys know that the largest Hindu temple in the United States of America? Robbinsville, okay? Next week, skip church. Go on down there and tell them Jesus is here. Get, get, out, get out your Bible. What does that mean if they have the largest Hindu church? It means this area is flooded with Hindus, okay? Hindus are people who need to know that Jesus loves them. They don't know that. There's all kinds of people in New Jersey. We're, we're really loaded with a bunch of different ethnicities. I was down in Ocean City a year or so ago, and I, this guy's pumping my gas, and I hear an accent. Tune in to accents, okay? Because the next thing, once you hear an accent, say, hey, brother, where, where are you from? That, that's an interesting accent. And they'll usually tell you. This guy was from Tajikistan. I bet 90% of you couldn't even find Tajikistan on a map. What in the world is he doing in Ocean City pumping my gas? Well, the Lord brought him there, and I gave him a little DVD about the life of Jesus. Here you go, bro. I don't know what happened afterwards, but that's not my concern. They're here, my friends. They're here. The greater Philadelphia area has well over 200,000 Muslims in the greater Philadelphia area, and that includes us here in Jersey. Um, so I say immigration is a beautiful thing because overseas you get put in jail. You know, you've got to be careful with that. There's no real, true freedom of religion. Wherever you have the government and a state church or mosque or whatever, uh, you've lost your freedom. There's another side note. Vote for guys that want to keep the U.S. Constitution because I want to tell you that thing was sent from heaven, Okay. It gives me the right to say the things I'm saying, and, and you as well. Now, the nations are here, but how do we find them? Well, first thing is you want to pray. Um, I gave lessons one time about reaching uh, Muslims, and the first week's assignment was, look, we're going to be here for six weeks. By the end of that six weeks, I expect you to have a Muslim friend. This one lady, it, it was like two, three weeks in, and she was all upset. She was oh, I don't know what to do. She's in the parking lot of the library taking some books back, and she prays, Lord, I, 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 where, in the, where am I going to find a Muslim? She says her amen. She looks to the left. There was a covered woman, okay, with a hijab walking right down the sidewalk. She opened her window. She said, excuse me, are you a Muslim? And the lady said, yes. Yeah. She said, will you be my Muslim? I guarantee you, if you sincerely pray to meet someone from another ethnic background, you will meet that person within a week. Okay, because you're praying, asking God to do something, and God loves, loves to see people give their heart to him. So you can pray. You can become a regular patron at an ethnic restaurant. I'm sure you have them around here. I'm not familiar with this area, but you can go. I like to go to Arab restaurants. There was a guy named Tassada I mentioned. He had, had a book, Once an Arafat Man. He had to leave the Middle East because he had been working for Yasser Arafat. He got in trouble, and he came here, and he served as a waiter. He's out in Indiana somewhere, and he served there for 19 years. Every Saturday night, there was an American guy who would come there, and you know he enjoyed his Arab food, and he was so kind. Tassada said, nobody ever thanked me for what I did in the Middle East, but here this guy thanked him. He was very nice. They became friends. 19 years. And one day, Tassada got on his knees and asked Jesus into his heart. How many of y'all like to go out to restaurants? Come on, this isn't hard, man. You go out and stuff your face with pierogies or whatever, you know. But make friends with those people. Be kind. And please leave a tip. My wife used to be a waitress. She was a born-again person. Some of you are nodding your head. You, can you imagine Christian people, eight people at a table, and they leave a track? She's a really sweet gal, but one time that happened just once too many, and she said, you know, I am a Christian. I could use a little more than that. God bless her. Now she just feeds me. 
you can, um, you can go volunteer at a refugee center, and I, I think you, it's up there, yep. Um, there's a couple of them there. I think I listed the Lutherans, maybe the, the Catholics. There's a secular one in Philly. Uh, years ago, I had contacted them, um, and they asked me to watch over and have, we had a little apartment at our house that was available, and so we had an Iraqi woman come with her two children. One was a 14-year-old boy, the other was a girl about 10, and they came to live with us. And uh, it was amazing because they had been with another family who, like when I went to pick them up, she said, I had to get out of there. The son was sleeping with his girlfriend. The son was only 15, not her son, but the household. He's sleeping with the girl right there in the house. They're not married. They're teenagers, okay? Uh, the first thing I saw when I walked in was a little Buddha statue, you know, so they're obviously not Christian. And this Iraqi Muslim lady said, I didn't know if my children were safer in Iraq with the bombs and the bullets or were they safer in America with all this immorality. Think about that. So she came to our house and we had a little swimming pool in the backyard, uh, one of those above ground things, and she said, I mean, why, why, your daughters, why, why do they dress conservatively? We wouldn't let them have two pieces. Said, your, your belly button's for your husband, and I don't want to see it as your dad. So, you can do what you want with that. Um, that's free. But she said, your daughters aren't like those other girls. I said, well, um, Rauda, I said, you know, they're, we're a Christian family. We don't, we don't display our flesh, you know, we're kind of conservative. Oh, okay. Can you tell me more? So she started, you know, asking about the Lord, and, and uh, nothing sensational came from it. But then she had a chance to move over to Conshohocken, and some relatives were there. And we went down to the second-hand shop. We bought some furniture for her, for her apartment. My buddy George had a truck, so we took her up there. And afterwards, we're having lunch with her relatives. Now, I'm sitting at the end of the table with, I don't know, her cousin, this guy, because you're supposed to, like, guys are supposed to talk to guys, girls talk to girls, so that's the way it is. And, and I'm talking to him, and out of my other ear, I hear her talking to his wife in Arabic, and I'm not eating. And the wife says, what's the matter with him? Why isn't he eating? Doesn't he like our food? And Rather says, oh, no, he likes your food. I cook for him as much as I can. He likes your food, but he won't eat unless he gives thanks to the God. Now, why am I telling you that? Because if you can invite someone into your home who doesn't know how Christians live, a simple thing like saying grace before you eat speaks volumes. So I heard her, and I said to the, hu the husband there, I said, yeah, she's right, I can't eat till we give thanks to God. Would it be all right if I prayed for you and your family? And he goes, well, uh, yeah, I guess. And I said, well, I'm a Christian. I pray in the name of Jesus. Would that be okay? And he goes, well, uh, yeah. And then I started, you know, I'm a little naughty inside, so I started having fun. I said, and in my house, we hold hands. Let's hold hands. <laughs> so there we were, holding hands, Muslims and Christians, look like the Waltons, man, you know, and I'm praying in the name of Jesus. And, and I've totally lost my place here. Let me see here. <laughs> Anyway, you can volunteer at a refugee center. You don't have to bring them to your home, although it's a great thing, but they need to learn English. You can help. Trust me, it's so easy to teach people English. Let's move on. We're almost done, um, and I want to wrap this up just sharing three truths about missions. First of all, missions is the heart of Christ. Jim, missions is the heart of Christ. Don't mistake that. This is what he's all about. And you might think he's slow, but in 2 Peter 3.9, we read, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Remember Tassada? How many years? 19 years. The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So Christ's heart is that no one would perish, but all would be saved. I mentioned a friend who was a Syrian Muslim, and he's up in Germany. When you share, you need to know this, when you share the gospel with other ethnicities and people from other religions, it can cost them dearly. I'm going to call my friend Bob, because his name can't be put out there, okay? But 
when he gave his heart to the Lord, he escaped Syria because they wanted to kill him in Syria, his own relatives and other people. He made his way down to Iraq. After a couple of years, he was able to come to the United States. His wife was already here. She said, I'm giving you one more opportunity to recant this Christian stuff. If you don't, we're getting a divorce. She divorced him. Now, I don't know what happened in your family when you gave your heart to Jesus, but I venture to say not many of you were threatened with divorce. His wife divorced him. People wanted to kill him. And you know, you talk to Bob today, and he's out there, he's sharing his faith with Muslims in Germany because they have the freedom to do that there. You know, for him, he said there was no turning back. How could I ever go back to that? He said, I've found peace. I've found Christ. Amazingly, he echoes the Apostle Paul who said these words, and you may recognize them. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Missions is the heart of Jesus. Let it be our heart as well. Secondly, missions is the hope of the condemned. This world is a mess, okay? You know that. It's a mess. In America alone, 1.7 million people attempt suicide every year. That's almost 2 million Americans can't stand it and they want to die. More than 48,000 actually succeed. And if you do the math, that's something like one death every 11 minutes. That means probably about 10 people have been dead, have taken their life since we started this morning. So many people live in hopelessness. They have no hope for tomorrow. The bills are piling up. They don't know what to do. They need Jesus, that's all I can tell you, because Jesus puts everything in order. He might not make you a millionaire. He didn't make me a millionaire. But he gave me a life that's worth living, I'll tell you that. Let's put that next picture up. Talk about hopelessness. This kid on the right, that's, that's my hand, and I'm, I, he's got this amulet around his neck, and I, we're, up, we're just on the border of Syria and Jordan there in a refugee camp. I said to him, son, what's this thing represent? He said, well, there's some verses for the Quran in there. I said, oh, why do you wear that? And he said, because the jinn have been after me. Now, some of you are familiar with the word genie. Genies aren't that funny Aladdin guy, okay? The, get that out of your head. These are like creatures, demonic things, okay? Uh, no, one of the things you could do if you go to an Arab restaurant, okay, uh, ask them what they think about jinn and offer to pray for the jinn to be uh, cast out. You know, they like that. Um, so this kid, he said, I said, tell me about it. And he said, well, when I'm playing with the other kids, the jinn come up and they clip me behind my knee and I fall down. I'm always falling down. So one of the older ladies said, if I wear this amulet, uh, the jinn, I'll be safe from the jinn. I said, oh, son, it doesn't work like that. If you want to be safe from evil, you need to have Jesus in your heart because Jesus has defeated the devil Jesus has defeated death, and Jesus loves you. You don't need that thing around your neck. And you know, we were there for a few hours, and that was early on, and at the end of our time there, uh, one of the Jordanian guys had a guitar, and he was leading these kids singing songs about Jesus. And that kid was right in the middle, just praising the Lord. I love being a Christian. <laughs> I really do. That gets me excited. I, can't, I want to go back now. I've got to wait two more weeks. Anyway, without the gospel, most of mankind is helpless, hopeless, and heading to hell. Would you consider today reaching out to somebody? Third thing, last thing, we're moving toward the end. Missions is the health of the church. Is this a healthy church? I know it's a busy church. I heard the announcement. Is it a healthy church? Missions is the health of the church. Someone once said this, the church that does not evangelize will fossilize. And boy, I see it. Okay, churches are closing all over. Last year, eight seminary slash Bible colleges closed in the United States. 
They couldn't afford to keep going because nobody was coming. That's why we're offering those classes down there in Marlton for $150 for the whole course. You'd shudder if you heard how much I paid to go to seminary. And that was back in the 80s, 90s. We ought to be educated, you know. Seminaries shouldn't be closing. They should be filled to the seams. Uh, churches should be filled to the seams. I mean, the world's messed up. So I would encourage you as a Christian in this church, invite the non-Christians to go to church. What are they going to say that's going to be so horrible? No, nah, I don't want to go to your dumb church. You know? So what? I grew up in an era where sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. Now everybody's hurt and offended. So I've made up my mind. I don't care. You can be offended all you want. It's all right with me. I mean, I still try to be loving, but the gospel is offensive. I've read that in my Bible, and it offends people. But it doesn't offend all people. A lot of people need it, and they know it. So talk to them. Invite them out. It's okay if they call you names. Um, look, look what happened back there in Mark at the end. After Jesus gave them that little speech, right? It says in verse 19, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them. Has the Lord spoken to anybody here? Okay, he does it every week through his word, okay? The Lord's speaking. He who has ears, let him hear. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. Now look what they did. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Jesus doesn't say get saved, now go to work. He said, hey, now that you're saved, let's live together. Let's go out in the world together and see what happens. You're sealed in the Holy Spirit. You're full of his word. You know, if you know so much as John 3.16, if you've memorized that, you know more scripture than over three-fifths of the people on the planet. And they all need John 3.16. Okay? Okay? Faith reveals itself in action. These guys got fired up. They left the lunchroom. They went out and made new friends. Somebody put it this way, you know, this partnership I'm mentioning. They said, without God, we cannot. But without us, God will not. Let's put the last slide up there, and I'm going to release all these folks. I thank you for being patient. But that is uh, C.T. Studd, who started a mission organization in Africa back in the 1800s. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Write that down, will you? If you've got a pen or some lipstick or something, write, write it in your Bible. As I'm looking around, I see some gray hair. I'm going to turn 72 next month. I don't have much time. But what time I have, I'm so grateful that God wants to work with a guy like me. You know? I was born in Camden. <laughs> Can anything good come out of Camden? <laughs> I think that's in the Bible somewhere. <laughs> Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Would you stand and pray with me? Thank you for listening and being attentive. Father God, we love you. We are standing before you as a people grateful for salvation. You did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We are so glad you broke through. Broke through the insanity of the way we lived without you. And surely it is insanity without Jesus. You bring sanity. You bring peace. You bring hope in our hearts. We're grateful for you. And Lord, as we stand here today, we realize that you not only have given us a great commandment to love you and love our neighbors, but you've given us a commission to go out and talk with those neighbors and make friends with them. I pray that for everyone standing before you right now, you will put a vision in their heart. Maybe put a, a face of someone they know in their heart. They've been wanting to talk to them, but they just haven't felt good about it. Lord, help them to feel good about it. Help us to share the one hope that we have. Hope for eternal life in our Lord Jesus. I bless this church, Lord. I thank you so much for their support, allowing us to go and do some of these things. And I pray 
And sometime in the near future, maybe one or two of them are going to be on the mission field with us. But Lord, as we said earlier, when we all leave this doors today, when we leave this building, we're going to enter the mission field. Help us to be cognizant of that. Help us to be cognizant of the presence of your spirit. And may anything we do, all the things we do, be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.